Wisdom of Wilderness. Take it away, Jake. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. We hope you're well. How's everybody doing? Fine. Good morning. Oh, that's right. Good morning out there. Well, uh, last time we made it to Of Myths and Emptiness Spring, which is page 85. And that is where we will begin our journey of the wisdom of wilderness today. At my other, at my other horizon place, the reservoir, I remember slipping my canoe into the water of early springtime just before dawn. The water from the lingering night is warmer than the morning, than the morning air, and there are mists eddying, rising, ever moving water clouds waiting to take me into them. I paddle with the softest, smoothest simplicity of which I am capable, wanting to dip into the stillness of the water and leave it undisturbed by sound or wave. As I paddle into the mists, they open for me and seem to retreat a little, making space being respectful but I breathe them in, and if I hold very still, I feel them exploring my skin. Among these gentle ghosts, the canoe glides so flowingly that I could swear there must be space there, space between the canoe's smooth belly and the film of the water's surface tension, a thin space holding only mist and emptiness. And my scientific mind knows it is true. The canoe moves on mist and emptiness, just a molecule or two above the water. The water and the mist kindly making space in the not yet dawn of springtime morning. The sun rises, lightning over the trees and not quite the place I expected, just as it did as I tried to draw the matriarch tree. The mists seem almost busy now rushing here, touching there, for they have to return to air and water in the sunlight that is to come. In the dawning, a slight greenness hovers around the black tree shadows of plant fresh on their bones. Color comes as the sun rises and the mists evaporate, bird sounds begin. In mid-spring, the beginning of each day is a reenactment of the whole season's coming. I'm going to read that again. That's a very interesting line. In mid spring, the beginning of each day is a reenactment of the whole season's coming. The night has been like winter, blacks and grays and cold shadows. The dawn brings awakening, the slow birth of color and sound. Finally, the day is spring itself, the greening and the blossoms and the birds. All right, summer. So he's doing a little bit of a uh, little bit of description of each season in this. <clears throat> Canoeing in summer is a feast of delicious green, luscious humidity. The water under the sun becomes bath warm and turns brown when it rains, and the canoe seems to ride lower in the water. Floating green-brown algae cling to the canoe just above the waterline. I want to see summer sunsets in my canoe. Evening is now more inviting than morning. The mornings are so much the same from one day to the next, so often already hot. Evenings bring more surprises a wind come, perhaps a storm. The sun both rises and sets in haze on many days, and sometimes the humidity is so high that the sun is just a blur, its light seeming to come from everywhere so that you don't even call it sunlight. It's just the day, the heat, the sweat you can feel smoothing the surface of your skin. Sweat has its own little surface tension and emptiness on your skin. And it becomes mist. It really does. The sun is very intimate in summer. 
no longer a celestial object, but a being of great presence and power moving upon me, closing in. I can't follow it objectively because it seems to be everywhere, so close, part of my own body. So that's interesting. He says the sun in summer ceased to be some distant celestial object and it becomes more present. Um, do any of you have a specific time of year that you notice uh, the sun or the moon more often, a specific season where either the sun or the moon becomes more present to you? Well, I try to avoid the sun. <laughs> and I don't like to sweat. That's why I live out here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is there a certain time of the year that you notice the moon more? Winter, I think. Yeah. Shining yeah. light. I'd say I always notice the moon the most around the time of the harvest, you know, like the autumn harvest. Yeah. Get those big harvest moons like Neil Young sang about. Fall. On an autumn morning in my canoe, the cool of the season is an arising freshness that can feel like new life, even when the leaves are dying. Symbolically, fall is slow death, a retreat toward the underground tomb of winter. But in its immediate presence, I feel the exquisite vulnerability of this season, a bearing, a gentle disrobing into beauty down to the bones. We say the leaves are turning color but they are actually revealing their true colors. Their soft reds and oranges and yellows, the sun colors that have been there all along, hidden by the chlorophyll of summer. The sun's southward travel and lowering in the sky, the briefening of days and cooling of air bring photosynthesis to an unhurried conclusion, the fading of green so before they fall, the leaves disclose their beautiful nature truth. More beautiful because it is more true. Leaves have fallen on the water. They float upon the surface on emptiness and hidden mist. And morning dewdrops, or perhaps the crystal remnants of forgotten splashes, glisten and christen their leaf dryness in the clarity of dawn. I paddle to one yellow gem carrying sycamore leaf, and it slips away on its thin film of emptiness as the wood side of my canoe approaches. I lean gently, but the lift leaf drifts beyond my reach. As the canoe stills and then turns gently in the breeze, another leaf glides toward me bearing a single water droplet, and I am allowed to lift the leaf and hold it toward the sunrise and clear rays sparkle from the droplet, and sun is inside the droplet. The leaf bears the sun. Winter. <coughs> the water company closes the reservoir to boating in December. Perhaps it is because of the danger of hypothermia as the water chills, or maybe it is simply and rightly to give the place a winter rest to allow it stillness in the cold. Some Native Americans in the Southwest enter a phase of keeping still in this season, staying inside and quieting their activities just as animals and plants enter their own winter repose. Now the winter solstice approaches when even the rising sun stands still on the horizon. On the last weekend, I put the canoe into the pre-dawn water and skim slowly north. I pour instant coffee in the coldness and the coming sunrise is ice fire in a sky of blue perfection. There is no wind, everything, the universe is keeping still. The canoe moves tentatively on the quiet surface of the water as if it too is nearly ready to rest in its winter time. Ah, ice has formed there where the shallows are, prisms and feathery patterns in thinly frozen water. I paddle to it, gliding upon waters that are now strangely, deeply black in the clean, absolute light. 
The ice is very thin here, exquisite, and the canoe's gentle bow curve crinkles it crisply, and shards too slim to see on edge slide atop one another over the ebony water. They are frozen mist, fractured slices shimmering on the emptiness of surface tension. Does she know, my little canoe, that this is her last time out? Soon I am as surrounded by the ice as I was by the springtime mist. This ice is not as respectful as the mist, less forgiving, now perhaps a quarter of an inch thick, etched in endless varieties of perfectly ordered line patterns, a vast intricate sketching in frozen water. It is divine geometry, including straight lines and right angles and everything in between, all formed with the infinite casualness of nature. God is showing off again. At the close of that last winter weekend, my son Paul helped me carry the canoe into the basement and place her on sawhorses. By that time, he was an English teacher, and now he's a writer. I wonder how vividly he remembers his little boy hilarity about shit on a stick. <laughs> During the next three months, I will give many good hours to sanding and smoothing the canoe working out her tiny ice scratches and her deeper scars from meetings with rocks. My fingers will touch every part of her. I will learn how to work with epoxy resin. She has, underground, she has gone underground for the winter as life in the wilderness does. I will also take many walks then in the cold fields and in the meadows and the blessed snow. And I know that things are not dead then at all. Deer and rabbits, quiet, fish and frogs and turtles nearly frozen, snakes hold up, birds, summer birds gone away, and winter birds now here, trees black and bare, seeds and cocoons and grubs and cicada larvae and everything underground, deep inside, down and in where you cannot see the life happening. Life is rich in the time of keeping still, that flowing, cells curing, changes taking place. I will return to the great tree and be convinced once again that her branches have danced in the night. And I will know that beneath her outer black stillness, there is life living deeply. Inside us all, in the depths of our winters, things are going on. Things we will have no clue of until spring comes, and perhaps not even then. All right, part six. Oh, Denise, you have a question, thought? I thought that this part of the book was probably the most enjoyable, the part I understood the most. His writing was very, um, is it poetic or just colorful and picturesque? You could see in your mind's eye what he was talking about. Mm. Do you feel that the, the poetic nature of it too is practical? Is that why you were able to, to get with it? No, I don't know about practical, but it may, maybe I don't go in canoes because I dump them. So, but it was just uh, how he described everything was was beautiful and just you know you could be there with him. Other mm. parts I'm not quite I'm not on the same plane as he is, but this one, this section I did. Well, and it was about seasons. So that's something that I think everybody has experience with. I mean, analogies he was making. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. When he gets more into some of the spiritual or interior processes, then that, that can be something that, you know, maybe might have a difference with people, but we all have seen the seasons pass. And so that might be more relatable too. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I was raised in suburbia. And I didn't hide climb for anything until I moved out here. And um, it wasn't part of my upbringing, suburban of DC. So I have no, uh, no um, things to, uh, no, I should, oh, I should understand this. 
Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting where we come from, our experiences, life, where we then move to, how that affects us. Um, place has a big impact on who we are and kind of how we how we look at what we read um, and how what we read can then also impact or open us up to kind of other places. Thank you. Okay, we are now in um, part six. And this is called Violence at Smith's Inlet. And the quote from St. John of the Cross is, in killing, you changed death to life. The reservoir stretches north and south for more than 12 miles a jewel of managed naturalness set in the center of a huge metropolitan area. It provides drinking water, flood control, and backup electrical power for the community. The water company maintains the surrounding watershed as a wildlife preserve, which means I have 5,000 acres of wilderness, wildness, just a few miles from my home. I could slip my canoe into the water and suddenly be where I saw no buildings, no roads, where the quiet was palpable. And the wildlife is there, deer and foxes, skunks and raccoons, osprey, hawks, bald eagles, great blue herons, and countless others. There I have lain on my back in the canoe on a summer midday and watched a great horned owl fly over me first one way, then another, so close I could almost touch him. There I have watched the mating, nesting, and hatching of Canadian Canada geese, and there I was attacked by a pair of bald eagles. But I will tell that story later. There also I have seen deer swim sweetly, softly, silently in morning mist from one shore to the other where the waters narrow, and a huge beaver who swam back and forth beneath the canoe, leaving trails of breath bubbles as the canoe drifted by his lodge. Squirrel. <laughs> Every time I hear the word squirrel, I think of that scene in a National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation where there's a squirrel in the Christmas tree. <laughs> squirrel. <laughs> All right. Greg and I even saw a squirrel swimming there once. A squirrel swimming, now that would be a sight. Sitting in the front of the canoe, Greg spotted it first. Hey dad, what is that? He was pointing to a long narrow shape in the water swimming toward the shore. I thought it might've been a snake, but it seemed to have a furry head and little ears and it was dog paddling. Wouldn't that be squirrel paddling? Rather than sinking <laughs> through the water. <laughs> We can't give dogs all the credit for, for inventing that stroke. We decided to get closer, even up close. I didn't identify it as a squirrel. You just don't expect squirrels in the middle of reservoirs. I told Greg I thought it could be an otter or even a weasel, but he said, Dad, do squirrels swim? I told him I'd never heard of such a thing, but that most animals can swim if they have to. How do you get way out here in the water, Greg asked. Again, I didn't have a clue. The little creature did seem to be struggling, perhaps more panicked by our approach than by the water. Tentatively, Greg extended his paddle toward the squirrel, which immediately turned and swam right toward the paddle. My first thought was of how sweet Greg was to want to rescue the squirrel. My, se my second thought was of what it might be like to have a crazed waterlogged squirrel in the canoe with us. <laughs> no, I shouted, but too late. The squirrel had grabbed Greg's paddle blade and was trying to climb up it to the handle to the canoe. Greg looked back at me quizzically as if wondering why I too would not want to save the squirrel. I said the first thing that came to mind, that thing is going to kill us if it gets in the canoe. <laughs> as silly as that must have sounded, Greg somehow understood. He lowered the paddle beneath the water until the squirrel floated off. 
Without missing a beat, the squirrel swam directly toward the canoe. <laughs> Two grown men afraid of a squirrel. <laughs> paddle, paddle, I shouted. Greg needed no encouragement. I think perhaps he looked into the deranged eyes of that rodent. <laughs> we both paddled fiercely with the dog paddling squirrel scrabbling along the canoe sides and then chasing us until we finally outdistance him. We sat catching our breath and watched the squirrel make it to shore, run across the rocky beach and up a tree. I don't know who started it, but the silence was interrupted by a snort, followed by a guffaw, followed by belly bending peals of laughter. Greg and I still talk about nearly being killed by an aquatic squirrel. Sounds like a good movie, The Aquatic Squirrel. <laughs> Along this reservoir, there are several picnic areas and coves with boat launching ramps. The one closest to my house is called Smith's Inlet. Driving down a hilly, curving road, you pass the boat ramp, and then at the very end of the inlet, you come to a picnic area and playground. Families gather there on pleasant weekends to fish, to walk along the shore, and to feed the waterfowl. From that civilized area, paths enter the woods or follow the waterside in many directions. Walk for five minutes in any direction, and you're pretty much alone. It becomes very wild very quickly, and even though people leave a lot of trash around, the place is always beautiful. Some of the paths lead to rugged, lovely fishing spots on outcroppings of rock or gentle sand beaches when the water level is down a bit. When the kids were little, long before I got my canoe, the whole family often went to the playground at the end of the inlet. Now I never go there, and it isn't just because of my health. <clears throat> Even if I were in perfect shape, I would still stay away from the end of Smith's Inlet. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so that reminds me of uh, uh, a couple, meh, four or five years ago, me and my wife were up in Montreal for a while, and then we were down by Lake Memphrogog, which is in the northern kingdom of Vermont. Um, and we uh, took out a canoe, and we paddled out to this. There's all these little rock, little rock islands in that lake. It's a pretty big lake. And uh, we went into this little cove and set the canoe on the shore, and Jess went on the rocks to like sunbathe, and I went in the water. And all of a sudden, I started to see all these things moving within like 10 to 20 feet of Jess, but there was like literally hundreds of them. And I said to her, I'm like, Jess, like, I don't know. I think there's like something here, but I don't know what it is. And all of a sudden I saw these like little creatures and they were all urinating in a circle around her. Huh. And they were minks. Really? Minks. Yeah. And we only found that out. I didn't really know there were minks until we went back and the woman who had lived there for 40 years said, yeah, there's, you shouldn't go out there. We call it Mink Island. <laughs> so <laughs> like you should have told us that beforehand. So anyway, they're all peeing around my wife and she's like, what's going on, you know? And then all of a sudden I see them jumping in the water from the rocks, swimming at me. <laughs> and I'm like, Jess, you know, we're being attacked by, you know, these little creatures. And so we like, we, I'm like, you get to the canoe on land, you know, push it into the water and I'll, I'll, I'll get in in the shallows. And so we got in and these, <laughs> these mink are jumping in the water and they're, and there's literally like hundreds of them. And they just kind of like went to the edge of the cove, you know, swam out kind of like to usher us away from their island. And then they, and then they went back and then we just, you know, canoed for another hour or two. But when we got back, we told the woman, I'm like, I'm like, I don't really know what we're, you know, I thought like some sort of you know, crazed hallucinogenic weasel of some kind. Um, but she's like, no, they're minks. It's a certain kind of mink. And they, they, for some reason, they congregate on that island. They're very territorial. And I'm like, I think you need to have a, since this is your canoe and you let guests, you know, paddle it, I think you need to tell us before we go out that we might get, you know, urinated on by a bunch of small weasel looking characters. <laughs> anyway, so if I ever write a short story, you know, it won't be the aquatic squirrel, but the urinating minx. <laughs> All right, turtle. 
I don't remember exactly when it happened. It must have been 1978 or 1979. It was a hot and muggy summer afternoon, July or August. The water clear near the shoreline and the woods a deep, rich summertime green. The three boys and I were going fishing. Betty and Julie, never much into catching fish, had stayed home. We were making our way along one of the paths at the inlet's end, not far from the playground, heading toward a rock point on the other side where we thought the fishing might be good. We came to a fork in the path and for some reason I went uphill and thank God the boys went down closer to the water. Off to my left, I noticed the remains of a small fire on a great flat rock, the usual beer cans around it. I responded habitually with science and disgust. They could at least carry out their trash. I hate trash in the woods, not so much because it hurts the environment or is unpleasant to the eye, but because I think it reflects a dedicated, though, un though usually unconscious human hostility toward nature. I am certain that people leave trash in the woods, not from simple carelessness, but because they fear and hate wildness. I've seen people throw beer cans into the woods and they do it with vengeance. Then something, I saw something in the middle of the rock, something set apart from the fire, something rounded, globular, moist, and still. It was a shape that registered something I knew, but different, distorted, grotesque. I took a few steps left and stared empty eyed at what someone had done there. Now let me see if I can write this. Let me pray. The thing was a box turtle, dead, but not long dead. Its legs were splayed out, stretched flat, its head extended, cold chin on cold rock. A few flies buzzed, a drop of sweat ran into my eye. What they had done, oh God, what they had done was carve a two inch hole in the turtle's back. In the top of the middle of the round mound shell of this living thing down into its insides. Sticking out of the ghastly moist hole were the butts of four cigarettes, filter tipped, two different brands. Well, that is, that's, that's tough to read. Strange that I should notice such detail when all I wanted was to get out of there, run far away from the thing and all memory of it, get to the kids and steer them away from it, keep them from seeing it, just get us all away. But even as I backed up and as my body and mind scrambled towards any place other than that immediate horror, Something else in me, against my prayers and wishes and fears, was calculating, imagining what the action had been like there on that particular rock last night. Party time, Levi's and t-shirts, I guessed. Maybe no women there, probably three or four men. I couldn't imagine one person doing such a thing. And there were the different cigarette brands. Two people is too intimate for such an act, so it takes three and four is even more likely because there's someone to have the idea and someone to egg him on to the terrible completion and someone to just go along with it and someone who will be horrified. Yes, four men, probably young, probably single, no females, not even playing the role of the one to be horrified because a woman I just believe would not have attended or permitted that particular little stunt. Moved out fast, suddenly a real wilderness man hopping over logs, dodging thorns, slipping between the trees back toward my boys who were Oh God, coming my way. Take that path there, I shouted. It's too rough this way. Yeah, too rough. Tell me about it. Earl, the oldest, kept coming toward me. I was sure he would see the rock from where he was, though not the thing that was on it. I had put my body between his eyes and the turtle. He knew something was wrong, but I said nothing more. All I could think was, God, don't let him see it. I pushed him brusquely toward the lower path. Through some mercy on God's part or some growing wisdom in Earl, he did not resist. We spent a while fishing. For once, I was uninterested in catching fish. I was preoccupied with two things, trying to keep the image of the turtle out of my consciousness and trying to figure a different way to go back when it came time, came, came time to go home. But there was no other way back. 
I would just have to keep their boys on the lower path near the water. I could not tell them about it or tell them why I was so shaken. How could I tell anyone when I could not bear thinking about it myself? Returning was more awful than the original encounter. I managed to keep the boys away, but passing the place was a pure experience of horror. You know what it's like to be aware of where something really bad is and to know it's really there and to be avoiding it, sneaking by? It's like something in your mind that you try not to think about, only it's there and you know it even though you pretend not to. And while half of you is writhing to get away from it, the other half is right there thinking it, chewing on it inside you. Or maybe when you were a little child and you thought you saw something move in the dark and you began to run, and the more you ran, the more the whatever it was grew in the darkness behind you, chasing, closing in, and you ran faster, and it was almost upon you. That's how this was. But this was real, real in form and substance and physical space. For years afterward, the image of the thing on the rock was in my mind just like that. And I kept trying to have it not be there. Psychiatrically, I suppose, I handled the whole thing wrong. The psychologically correct way would have been to confront the situation, face into my abhorrence, accept the gas in us, maybe spend a little time with the turtle, perhaps even bury the thing with reverence and a few significant thoughts about human violence and prayers for healing. Rituals are supposed to help. For that matter, to really make the most of a family opportunity, I could have even called my boys over and said what awful things people can do. And we could have had a little sharing about their feelings. Fat chance. It's that sort of stuff that got me tired of psychiatry. Besides always being about management, the psychologically correct ways of handling things are often just downright impossible in the real moment. This of course makes things worse because you know that you're upset and you, and you also know that you are not handling being upset in the correct way. And so you are double upset. This is the negative side of psychology, like the negative side of religion. It gives you all kinds of good ways to manage your life only you can't really do them, so you wind up feeling worse than before. <laughs> I never did handle the thing with the turtle correctly. I was never able to return to that rock or to that path through the woods or even to the lower path by the water. I did not return to the sinlet at all for several years after the turtle. And when I did go back, I put my canoe in the boat launch far east of the inlet's of the inlet's end. The first time I returned to the inlet, it was because I had heard rumors of good fishing there and my fishing addiction overcame my abhorrence of the place. There were times back then when the possibility of catching fish could overcome just about anything. But I always stayed well away from the paths that led toward the rock. I never ever went back to the place of the turtle. Today is the day they bring the Copper River salmon in. Oh, wow. Yeah, big deal. Hmm. $90 a pound. Uh huh. So that was, yeah, that, that must have been tough for him to write about. Um, this, this little section is called Fish. One sunny Saturday, years later, I was fishing off the point where Smith's Inlet joins the big water. I had cast a worm into the shallows and was leaning back against the tree, waiting, lazing. Perhaps 15 minutes had passed when I noticed the line begin to move. I softly released the bale on my reel to let the line play out. Take it now, I thought. People who bottom fish know a strangely peaceful expectancy right then when whatever it is explores the bait and everything is softly suspended, gently poised, it is also delicate. The line moved out slowly, tentatively at first, then steadily. It had all the signs of a catfish, my favorite, my great dinner fish. It was almost time to set the hook and my usual thoughts of hugeness came, the possible gigantism of the fish. I flipped the back, waited until the line was taut, then jerked the rod to set the hook. Oh, yes, yes, it was big. It was like hooking a truck. 
The familiar anticipation came, almost a fear, as I reeled the line and wondered what it was that I had wounded and was so connected with through the slender nylon filament. At such moments, you can sense the life of the fish at the end of the line, a very special aliveness, unique to each species. I reeled in, the drag spinning off and on, and it just did not feel like a catfish. Catfish can be very sluggish on a line, but they tend to jerk this way and that, and this thing was just swimming steadily in a straight line. It would rest a while, and I'd reel it in some, like a dead weight at the end of my line. Then it would start swimming again, and there was nothing I could do but let it run. The line would break if I resisted. This was hardly a fight. It felt more like waiting for a bus. <laughs> It was as if the fish did not even feel the hook, as if he were entirely unaware of it and just swimming at his pleasure, unknowingly allowing me to haul him back towards me whenever he paused. Inside, I was growing increasingly excited and a little frightened. The sheer weight of the thing thrilled me and had to be the biggest creature I'd ever hooked in these waters, but I was afraid about what it was. Maybe it wasn't a fish at all. Perhaps it was a snapping turtle. I'd seen them nearby as big as three feet across. Oh God, don't let it be a turtle. I could not stand hooking a turtle. How could I get the hook out, even if I got the thing to shore? And if he broke the line and thought of him swimming off with a hook in his mouth or worse in his throat, too much. It was more about what might be on the end of the line. Even in freshwater, deep bait fishing is archetypal it is about as Jungian as life can get. You cast your line into dark, unseen depths and something is alive there and it connects and you start to bring it to the surface, to daylight, to consciousness. And you begin to wonder if you really want to see what it is. But there it is, whatever it is on the end of your line. Like it or not, you are connected, committed, enchanted. The pulling and waiting went on for at least half an hour. I took great care not to let the line break. And after a while, I really got into enjoying the pull, the swim, the getting closer, the not knowing. Three other fishermen set down their rods and walked over to watch. What you got there? I haven't the slightest idea. Looks big. Yep. The competitiveness of fishing is unique. It is usually implicit, unspoken at most joked about, but it's fierce and in its way deadly. At that moment, I was doing just fine. I had three guys just standing by me, their own rods forgotten, awed by my encounter with something huge and I, in excellent fisherman form, was acting as if it happened every day. <laughs> Finally, I saw its shape, a fishy shape, definitely not a turtle, thank God, nor any shadowy psycho monster from my nightmares. Just a really big fish, the kind I always hoped to catch. I stepped back to reach for my net and one of the fishermen handed it to me, being helpful as part of the game. Catfish, I hope, I said casually. Carp, maybe. Yeah, carp, big one. Yeah, gonna keep them? Not if it's a carp. Yeah, what you fishing with? Worms, deep. Uh-huh, I'm using minnows. Fishers who use minnows are a class above those of us who use worms. But at the moment, I was the one with the big fish, and that's what finally counts. At the end of everything on Judgment Day, it's the absolute size of your fish that determines the value of your life. <laughs> the fish lays over on its side in the shallow water, exposing round bronze scales the size of quarters. Wow. It was a carp. I was a little disappointed that it wasn't a catfish, I'd had some thoughts about broiling catfish steaks. But it was big, truly, wonderfully, breath-stoppingly big. And to my human judgment, it was also stupid. <laughs> right up until I got him on shore, this carp did not seem to understand that he was on the end of a line, that there was a hook in his tender mouth, and that if he had been a catfish, he would have been doomed. He was far too big for the net, but I was able to use it to lever him onto the sand. And there he just lay, glistening in the sun, great fishy eyes, seemingly unperturbed, unknowing of anything. The other fishermen walked away in silence and I opened my tackle box to get my disposable camera. 
I took the picture of the fish and then got my pliers to remove the hook. Carp's mouths are soft and delicate compared with those of most other fish, and I tried to be careful getting the hook out. As I pried, he jerked, flopped, flipped over, and knocked the pliers out of my hand. I tried again, holding the pliers tight, trying with my other hand to keep him still, and again he flopped, and the hook came out, but there was a sickening cracking sound in blood, and I saw that I had broken his jaw. Horror inside me. Horror like the turtle. Something in me at that very moment, something swamped with guilt, wanted desperately to blame the fish for flopping over, just as perpetrators of violent crimes often blame their victims. I was trying to get the hook out. He shouldn't have jerked like that, but the facts were indisputable. I caught the fish with a hook in his tender mouth, and then I took his picture while he was laid out vulnerable in the sun, and then I broke his jaw. Could he survive? I had no idea. Carp are bottom feeders and quite primitive, whatever that means. Maybe he would make it, probably not. I did not feel good inside. I did not feel good at all. I lifted him back into the water as gently as possible with great tenderness, as if that would make a difference. I even told him I was sorry, so sorry. I listened to my heart, which was quietly asking forgiveness from God and the fish. I was on my knees in the cool water as I let him slip out of my hands, wanting the water to be gentle for him, wanting something healing for his jaw and my spirit. He swam off lazily, steadily, as if nothing had happened, but something had. I understood something about our daughter Julie's drug addiction. My fishing addiction was a milder form of the same thing. I had killed so many fish, wounded so many others, but I kept doing it. It always bothered me, but I kept doing it. It was perhaps 15 minutes, maybe half an hour before my mind was able to do its denials and rationalizations. Then I put another worm on the hook, cast it out, leaned back against the tree as the afternoon sun glinted from small waves and the reflected light flickered among the leaves. Hmm. His, uh, his most famous book is about addiction uh, and he got into writing about it because of his daughter. I thought that was an unusual connection there. I, I, I'm not sure whether it, it almost felt like he pulled it out of nowhere, but then again, I think out. somewhere somewhere deep in his subconscious, he probably needed to make that connection. To understand why she, I guess what he talked about it. Uh, he killed so many, wounded so many. If I kept on doing it, I guess this is what addiction. Yeah, and he says it always bothered, it's, he says it, oh, yeah, and it, it always bothered me, but I kept doing it. It was just perhaps 15 minutes, maybe half an hour before my mind was able to do its denials and rationalizations. Then I put another worm on the hook and um, yeah, you know, even though he, he feels deep down at that moment saddened and like, maybe I shouldn't do this. There comes the rationalization, there comes the denial and 15, 20 minutes later, he's doing the same act again. All right, let's see if this duck will cheer us up. The following spring, after a completely uneventful day of fishing off the same point, I was walking back along the shoreline to, towards my car. As I approached the launching ramp, I noticed a commotion in the water and a small gathering of people on the shore. Some of them were shouting and a couple of young men were throwing rocks at a swan that was swimming in circles about 20 feet from the shore. I ran forward, hoping to stop them before they hit the swan, but then I saw what was really happening. Slowly, steadily, the swan was in the process of killing a duck. I couldn't tell what kind of duck it was, although only that it was very small, very frail. In a supremely dedicated way, the swan was drowning it. 
The swan swam over the duck again and again, using his breast and feet to keep the duck under himself, underwater, for as long as possible. As soon as the duck escaped to catch a breath and utter a tiny squawk, the swan would submerge it again. The duck was exhausted, disoriented, nearly dead, too far gone to be frantic, yet still reflexively grasping and gasping for the surface, for air, for life. The guys throwing stones were trying to save the duck, but the swan seemed unfazed, even unaware of their attack. He was dead set in his purpose, implacable, relentless, and terrifyingly calm. The drowning took a very long time. Perhaps if the duck had not lost its bearings, it might have made for sure, but instead it moved farther and farther out into the water, its pursuer never once letting it rest. The two were finally beyond rock throwing distance and the small group of people slowly dispersed. No one said a word. What was there to say? I have no idea what they felt, what was in their minds, except that it was not a good moment for any of us. I stayed, I watched, at first, I tried to explain it. Could the swan be defending a territory? I did not understand how any bird could establish a territory there where so many birds of different species congregated to feed. And with so many other bigger birds around, why pick on this tiny, frail creature of a duck? Was the duck wounded, perhaps, or sick? Was this some survival of the fittest mission the swan was instinctively performing? Reasoning was hopeless, but I wanted there to be a reason. I needed a reason. The swan, it appeared, needed no reason at all. I couldn't avert my eyes from him. He was so patient, so supremely dedicated, unswerving, steadfast in the killing. There seemed to be neither hostility nor mercy in him, only the steady, calm, drawn out process of the drowning. I wondered why he did not strike the duck with his beak or hit him with his wings, I had seen an angry swans do that in the past. I cannot help but feel he did not strike the duck because to do so would have hastened the death. And this particular death was to be a slow, tortured death by drowning. It is difficult to refrain from attributing motives to animals. We so desperately need their behavior to make some kind of human sense. I think it has to do with knowing down deep that much of our own behavior doesn't make sense either. We really want there to be good reasons somewhere. For me to admit that there may have been no sense, no motive for the swan's deadly play is to admit that such violence, such destructiveness can just happen. It would be like so much of nature, just what it is. And that means it can be that way in human beings as well. So I stood alone where the parents had shuffled their children away, where the young men had left in silence, and I looked far out into the water and watched the swan finish killing the duck. Or perhaps I watched the duck die under the relentless perseverance of the swan. Or maybe I watched the water and the sky within the embrace of which, during those long, long moments, some ripples and feathers simply churned. To me, it was an emotional eternity until finally the duck no longer surfaced. The swan swam in slow circles there for a while. I would say to make sure the duck was really dead, but that's a human reason. And then he took his place again among the other swans and the geese and the ducks at the upper end of the inlet, near to the picnic grounds where the children were again happily throwing breadcrumbs. See the pretty swan? Oof. Well, you know, inevitably in a book called The Wisdom of Wilderness, there's definitely going to be death and nature and things which we can't reason with our human minds. Um, you know, and that's one of the things about nature. Um, we, human beings can't always truly understand it because even though we are a part of nature, we also tend not to live directly in it. You know, we carve out places for ourselves of safety. Um, but yeah, I've seen some things while I was camping or canoeing and stuff, animals and animals, and uh, I could never make sense of it because it wasn't for food. Um, and I think that's the hard thing. I think so many times, like me and Jess are watching this documentary right now um, on wild babies, you know, babies in the, the wild. 
and there's these three little tiger uh, lion cubs, you know, and they're very cute. And it talks about how the mother has to feed them and stuff. So the mother goes out and kills a zebra. And then the little cute lion cubs go and tear into the zebra, right? And, uh, you know, that's a living at that's a living animal that has to sacrifice its life so the cute little lion cubs can feed, right? I think the one thing I learned while while living on organic farms all over the world, which really which really hit home, was that um, pretty much death grows everything. This one farmer was telling me, you know, how at night, you know, there's just hundreds of millions of pounds of insects that die and fall to the earth every night, especially in the summertime. And then that stuff decays and forms that really rich fertile humus that plants, you know, dig into. And that constant death feeds this constant rebirth of life. So I'm trying to put a, you know, putting a very positive spin on all this. <laughs> what, what was the quote at the beginning of that chapter? Oh yeah, by St. John of the Cross. It was, it was a long time ago. Okay. In killing, you changed death to life. Yeah, I wondered what that meant, but now it makes sense. Yeah. So he's he's having some that's three particular things that he witnessed all in that one place, which I guess is why. I played the ominous soundtrack before we went into that. Um, you know, but that one place, three different scenes of death that really um, showed him the reality of the natural world and also the reality of his own inner process as well, which is an important thing um, because the book is titled The Wisdom of Wilderness. So he's coming to grips. And, and I guess now after you look at the three things, I can see how his utilizing his daughter's drug addiction and his own fishing addiction kind of fits into this larger schema that he's presenting here, which is psychological frailty of the human being. Um, the part of the psychological aspect or the reality of nature that we can't understand maybe with our own human process. So he's getting into like a, a deeper unknowing here um, that the human psyche you know, can't really comprehend why animals do things because we're not in their mind at that moment or in their, or maybe more, we're not in their instincts at that moment. So if anybody sees a duck or a squirrel today, be kind to them or a turtle, you know, take them out to lunch, <laughs> get them a massage, um, you know, whatever you need to do, even get them a therapist if they ask for one. Just, just, just help them out and uh, help one another out. Be kind to one another. And I will see you all next Tuesday for more Wisdom of the Wilderness. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Peace.